COVID-19, better known as coronavirus, has spread throughout the world. Symptoms of this respiratory disease may include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. These symptoms may show up 2 to 14 days after exposure. If you are experiencing these symptoms and have come into contact or are in an area with an ongoing outbreak, please call a hotline and or consult with a physician. Clean and disinfect high-touch surfaces. For more information, please visit cdc.gov forward slash COVID-19. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Betsy Greenleaf, premier pelvic health expert and women's wellness warrior. I'm the host of Some of Your Parts podcast. As you may already know, we're interrupting our normal scheduled podcast to bring you a series on COVID-19 care, how to survive during our time of coronavirus and quarantine. I have specialists ranging from those to cover information about the virus to those on how to deal with communication, well-being, wellness, and mental health. So join me in listening to these over the next few days. Thank you. Stay well. On today's show, we'll be talking with Dr. Erica Gray about homeschooling. Dr. Erica Gray is the co-founder of Toolbox Genomics and has her doctorate in pharmacy from the University of California at San Francisco, where she worked as a pharmacist at a level one trauma center in both the inpatient pharmacy and in the emergency room. Her experiences in the emergency room of seeing the terrible manifestation of chronic diseases and in helping patients understand their biomarkers in relationships to their health paved the way for co-founding Toolbox Genomics. Dr. Gray herself was homeschooled until the seventh grade, and she's been homeschooling her two children for the last 12 years and has some wonderful suggestions for all of us newbies at this. So I'd like to welcome on today's show, Dr. Erica Gray. So I have with us today, Dr. Erica Gray. Thank you, Erica, for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Betsy. So I know... You have tons of things I want to talk to you about, like your company and everything, but more importantly, for us who've never homeschooled before, <laughs> we are going crazy and you're probably laughing at all of us. So <laughs> it's been, yeah, it's been, um, it's been really interesting because all, all of a sudden I've had all these people say, oh, so this is what your life is like. <laughs> I was like, yes. Yeah. So tell me, yeah. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, what do you do? And then, and then tell us how you manage the the homeschooling. So I have a 15 year old and an 11 and a half year old, and we've been homeschooling them from day one. And I was homeschooled. So I was homeschooled until seventh grade. And then I made the choice that I really wanted to go to school and try that experience. And so I've seen both sides. And it's really, really interesting having been homeschooled and going to public school and college, and then now doing it again with my children. And so for us, this is normal. This is business as usual. Nothing has changed, but I have just like Facebook has exploded and all of these different people are posting and it's, it's really, really difficult for them because it's a complete paradigm shift. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, we're one week down and into our second week. The, so far, the second week seems to be a little bit better because everyone's like settling into the pattern. But the first yes. week was absolutely miserable. I think more for me than for them because I just couldn't get anything done because I wasn't quite sure. I didn't know what to do with myself with them. Right. And I think that's the overwhelming thing about homeschooling is you go, well, I don't know how to do this. How do I make sure that we're hitting all of those milestones and, and um, those different key points that they're testing on in, in the evaluation test, et cetera. And what I tell people is that you know, with homeschooling, it becomes a much more fluid process because you're going to have children that are going to just excel in certain areas. And there's going to be other areas that they need help with. But when you homeschool, you notice immediately where are their strengths and where are their weaknesses. And so you're going to be able to um, intervene and apply the appropriate support for them that you're not necessarily going to have in the school system because with the school, you're waiting until the report card comes back or the exams and you go, okay, well, now we need to take action. And so I, I think I, sh I should preface this with your children are not going to get behind academically 
in these next three or four weeks. It's going to actually probably rejuvenate them and they're going to get a whole new refreshing perspective that they haven't had. And they're going to develop and explore different interests that they haven't had or they have always wanted to explore, but they haven't had the time to do. And I think this is an amazing opportunity for us as parents to give them that latitude. Because from my perspective, as long as your child can do math, can read, and can write well, you know, again, following a certain uh, grade appropriate levels, everything else is gravy, right? If they can read, you can hand them National Geographic and say, I want you to you know, pick a topic that interests you, tell me about it, and then I want you to go do some research on the Mayans and write me a five-paragraph essay about how they use technology. Done. You've done history, you've done science, and you've done writing in that. Wow. Yeah. And it's something that they're super interested in, and they're going to come back and say, do you know what I learned? And this is so interesting. And oh my gosh, I'm going to do the Aztec snack, and we're, we're going to talk about chocolate. Um, and so that for me about homeschooling is so much fun because now you can make it really fluid and you can make it fun for them. So now they, they will go back to learning because remember when your kids are little and they're three and four and they're so excited to learn like, Oh, can I have that workbook? I'm going to do homework now. I'm going to trace my letters and you lose that in school. And yeah. now this is that opportunity to bring them back and really encourage them to explore. And I think for anyone who is really struggling right now and they're like, I don't even know where to start, use Khan Academy. Khan Academy is amazing. It's free. They have quizzes. They have programs. It's all set up for you. And you can sign up as a parent and tell them what you want them to work on. Then they have the quizzes. You can evaluate it. And you go, oh, fractions are a problem. So we got to do more on fractions. So that, that probably right there is the number one resource that I use. Um, and then outschool.com is incredible. So outschool, they actually have semester long classes. They have a month long classes. And what I do is I go through and I pick out the classes that I think the kids would like. And then I tell them, what, what would you be interested in? And right now, OutSchool has a $100 offer so that if your school was shut down, they will actually give you a $100 credit toward their classes. So I signed my son up for a conducting class. They're signed up for this murder mystery, solve it um, opportunity. My daughter does geometry through there. They have a live class every month. I'm uh, sorry, every week. My son does Pokemon is he hasn't been able to find anyone in the area who likes Pokemon. So he does it with them on that. So realizing, and here's the other thing. There's so many resources out there. You just need to get focused. So if the school system is set up and they are, this is like, this is what they want you to do. Great. Knock that out. And then tell your kids in the afternoon, I want you to explore things that interest you. And you can't go on to YouTube. You can't go on your phone. You can use it to get the springboard idea, but then after that, you're outside or you're playing with wood or you're glue gunning and we're off of the screen. <laughs> I know that's been the, we've been lucky in our school district, at least in that they kind of started preparing for this. And we, in, in our school district, we're also very, very fortunate that every kid has a Chromebook. <sighs> um, so yes. they were able to transition to... We still don't have Zoom classes, which I had hoped they would do virtual classes, but they are able to go on and at least communicate with their teachers and they're given assignments every day. Um, I know though my other family members, their schools were let out and were like, sorry, you're gone. Yeah. Like here, like have your kids back. And, you know, I think that's really challenging too, because what do you do with them? You know, and in right. that, it, I hear that from friends like, oh my God, are our kids going to be left behind? Are they going to have to repeat this? Are they not going to graduate, you know, on time? Yes. Um, so there's so many different issues out there. And I, so I think too, you know, like if you have a senior, then that's a very different situation versus a sixth grader or a, a third grader. 
And I would, my suggestion would be um, tap in, you know, if you have a senior or an advanced high schooler, tap into your local community college or your university, find someone who's willing to tutor. You know, they'll hop on Zoom with you. It's going to be a cheaper rate. Plus, by the way, your child's going to get one-on-one attention. So they're going to move so much faster um, than they would in the classroom. And that's the other thing is that, you know, if you think about it, you have to move a class of 20 or 30 along. So your ability to move people faster or slower is, is really limited. And so I really don't think children are going to get behind as long as they're doing some type of math every day, some type of reading, some type of writing. And it could even be journal entries. You just need, like, it's that practice of that mental um, acuity and, and it's a muscle. You just got to do it. I know because I know I don't tell my kids this, but I hate math. And my dad is a math, (laughs) my dad is a math teacher. Um, and they're coming to me and they're doing these problems in their head. They're like, Hey mom, can you check this? And I'm like, looking, and I'm like, oh, you know, I got to write this stuff out. And they're like, they're doing adding and subtracting and doing everything in their heads. And I'm going, well, that's because they're doing it every day. I'm not doing right. it every day. So it does make sense. And, and I'm lucky enough that my kids are fourth and sixth grade. So once we got over the headache last week of, I think there was a lot of mom guilt. Like, I think there was a yeah. lot of like, I need to be hovering and making sure they're doing what they're doing. And so I, you know, I think a lot of moms, we do that. We put everybody else before ourselves. So I think last week was more of an adjustment for me. And my husband finally had to say, listen, they're in school all day. Let them do their school. If they have questions, you know, give them, Hey, the last 15 minutes of every hour is like, open time for questions, right? You know, if you have a question, you first try to ask your teacher or you put it aside and ask me at the, the last 15 minutes of every hour, or you, you make up a, your own office hour yes. time so that you can get things done because, you know, a lot of us now are working from home and that's even a challenge <laughs> in itself. So Yeah. So actually those are so two great points. And those are things that we implemented this year because I was really struggling because they would pop in and out and interrupt my workflow. So we instituted office hours. So every child gets a half hour in the morning and they need to tell me what they're going to do and what, and and they've got their check marks as far as, you know, their check boxes. And then, um, then we go through questions. So do you understand the essay prompt? that you have. Okay. So are, do you have any other questions? If not, let's work on the essay. Let, let me help you outline it. And the other thing that I've done is I tell them I'm working for the next two hours. I'm not available. If you have questions, bring it to me after those two hours, I will come tell you I'm free. So please hold on to those questions. But by the time those two hours are done, I expect X, Y, and Z to be done. And you can do that. I would say probably starting at third grade I would say anyone younger than that, you're going to need to do the every hour. I'm free. You know, at the at every 10 minutes, you know, uh, sorry, every hour you give them that 10 minute window. And then the younger ones, you want to really use utilize nap time. You're going to want to utilize nighttime. <laughs> you're going to want to get up earlier. So it's just going to be, it's it's going to be strategic for you, but the the key for them is that focused attention. Because if they feel like you've really given them focused playtime, you've gone out for a walk, you've done something, they'll leave you alone. But if you if they don't feel like they had mom time, they're going to be constantly, oh, oh, what about this? What about that? And then they'll instigate fighting and arguing. And um, this is a great time for sticker charts and competitions. So whoever can stay quiet for the next hour and bring me something really cool at the end, gets a sticker and you add up your stickers and you get to redeem it for something. You know, someone gets to pick the game or the movie or Sean the Sheep, by the way, if anyone has ever checked it out, it is so cute. It's on Netflix. They're seven minute shorts and it's completely age appropriate for all ages, but that can be a fun reward to do as a family at the end of the day. But it's gotta be that give and take and also give yourself some grace. It's not gonna be perfect. And it's okay. Your children are not going to come out scarred. In fact, they have more time with you than they've ever had. And that's a gift. 
Yeah, I was thinking about like families with younger kids. So you've done this their whole lives. Yes. So I, I see, you know, now that I'm in my second week, I'm like, we made, everybody made schedules because I couldn't have it haphazard. It's like, you know, we're following the same schedule that they had for times of when they would normally do things in school. So everybody's done with that. And if they finish something, they move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I do notice that, I don't know if it's the the amount of work that they're doing is less, or maybe just the fact that they're able to go at their own pace, that they're usually finishing after lunch. And then we've like you have, we've instituted like, okay, well, you're not going on the tablets. You're not watching TV. We're going to do something educational, pick something you want to learn. My one daughter wants to learn how to play like guitar. I'm like, okay, well, let's find some YouTube videos on how to, you know, or we've done some like art projects or one day, because it's unfortunately been very rainy in New Jersey. We're like, okay, we'll go on Netflix, but we're going to watch a documentary. And yes. we watched a really cool documentary on pangolins, which I didn't even oh. know what it were these adorable, cute little animals that <laughs> I'm just now obsessed with. <laughs> so, um, but I guess what I was going back to is that now I'm in a second week with a 10 and a 12 year old and they are very independent. Yes. So what about those families that have preschoolers, kindergartners, first graders, second graders that don't have that attention span? How do you manage that aid, those age groups? Yeah. So those are the ones that they've got to get out and do some type of, of play. And it might be, um, we actually got this really cool uh, trapeze, like a yoga trapeze for off of Amazon for 50 bucks um, or a rebounder. You're know, like those small trampolines, something where you say, okay, now we're going to have a competition. You're going to do somersaults and um, you know, the, you're going to play on the trampoline, something where they can burn off the energy because that, that is key. You can't, if they, if they have had highly focused activity where they've sat and played and done a really good job, you've got to counterbalance it and do something and, and just get them moving. Um, don't forget to feed those kids, by the way. <laughs> I cannot even begin to stress. I know. I know. It's tough. <laughs> I was like, am I the only one who's done that? I'm like, no. all of a sudden you look at the time, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> they haven't eaten. <laughs> because here's what happens with those kids. They will sit and play and they get so involved in their imaginary play. You're like, yes, two hours and we're still going. This is amazing. And what you don't realize, and you will say, hey, are you hungry? Like, no, no, I'm good. Because they're so involved. Do not believe them. Because they are starved and you will say, hey, okay, so we're going to pack up our clothes. Wah! I can't pick it up now. This is so hard. You're like, I, I just don't understand what happened. So make sure just like in your head every hour and a half or maybe even every hour, depending on your child, like just put out a plate of apples so that they eat it. Put some almond butter out, some carrots, something so that they are eating and, and they'll eat. They're really good about it if it's available. But if you can't do that and they've played really hard for that hour and a half, two hours, you've got to stop and just say, here's some food I want you to eat. And you may need to pull them away. You may need to change direction and it kills you to do it. Um, But it's going to prevent a massive meltdown that's going to be very difficult for you to recover from. Um, They need change. So don't leave all the toys out. Pick up a bunch of toys, put it in a box, put it in a room, do something so you can rotate them and bring them out. And now they're new and exciting. Um, If you have daughters, usually the dolls are a huge thing. So even if you can just show her, hey, um, we're going to create this cool little baby carrier, or here's how you can utilize these new scraps of fabric for them. Do it. Boys, they love cars, they love trains, they love airplanes. So anything you can give them to utilize ramps, like I've used Ikea bookshelves, um, things, so they can set up races with their cars. And, the, and you know, and again, if you have one of each sex or gender or more, they'll get together and play really nicely, especially if it's a cool activity. So, and also remember, they're freshest in the morning. So get any academics done with them first thing in the morning, because if you try to do it at five o'clock at night, it's not going to happen. So you need to adjust your schedule 
that that's between nine and 11, you're not doing calls, you're not doing anything, you're just going to work with them one on one. And after that, now you can start scheduling your other things, or you might have to get a little up a little bit earlier to to get some of those emails and get the day going. But then if once you've invested that time with them, you can really reap the rewards in the afternoon. And a lot of them are going to be also napping at that age. So you can utilize nap time. If you have one that's five or six and doesn't want to nap, quiet time. There are so many different um, audiobooks on Audible. Just put it on for them and say, you're going to go into your room. And for the next hour, I just want you to listen. You, do, you, you know, And just let them go off into their own little world. Um, Jim Weiss is someone who does these amazing stories and he did an entire series called story of the world. And our son's history is outstanding because you just listen to this thing over and over again, but you can borrow it from the library. You can, I think you can find it online and just even something like that. Now they're getting history and you, they're getting quiet time and you've got a break to do your things. So just being mindful of those things and get them to bed early and keep them on a schedule for those young ones. That's really important because it's easy to say, oh, they're doing so well. I'm going to keep working. And it's just, (laughs) it doesn't work. I noticed too, this is the first time I've actually even looked into it with, with my older ones that they were not only were getting their work done, but I was getting them books and they were reading the books much quicker than they ever have. Yes. And like we're going through books like crazy. And I'm like, guys, I'm not going to keep ordering Amazon books. Like I'm keeping an Amazon in business, but I actually was able to find that with our library, you can mm-hmm. download books. I mean, the libraries are closed, but you can download them. Yes. So uh, Hoopla and Libby are uh, Overdrive, I think is the other one, depending on your library. And our kid, that's exactly what they do. They just hook their Kindle up to it because I have voracious readers too. And so, you know, it's like two hours done with the book next. But it sounds like you've had kids that have been very interested in learning. I've talked to some of my, my friends and neighbors from a distance and some kids are really struggling right now. Yes. You know, so do you have any advice for the kids that are struggling, for the families that are struggling with the work? So it's almost, um, those kids, I almost feel like they have to go through a digital detox um, because they've been fed so much information and it's been so passive on their end that when you ask them, they just say, I don't know. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. And it, it's very frustrating as a parent, especially those of us who are really out there and like go-getters, like, well, how could you not know what you want to do? This is such a foreign concept, but they haven't been given the opportunity and that mental break and freedom to say, gosh, what is it that interests me? And um, I just view it as an as a amazing opportunity to say, okay, do you, would, does the idea of art or science interests you more. And, and you, you can just start broad and, and lead them down some questions because I guarantee under all of those I don't knows is someone who has all kinds of really cool little ideas, but they've just, it's never been allowed to come to the surface. Um, the other thing is just saying, you, here's the entire house. You, there's no TV, there's absolutely nothing digital. And in the next hour, I want you to come to me with a super cool idea that you want to share on YouTube. There's a lot of kids that are motivated by the entrepreneurial opportunity um, of that they can make a little bit of money, and but they need an idea first. And so that's that's another thing is how can they really start actually learning and leveraging a lot of these digital opportunities that they've been presented with in a really constructive and meaningful manner and getting them to realize like, oh, so I actually have this idea and I could monetize it or I can learn how to utilize Instagram better. You're like, I could actually, my mom will pay me to do her social media. And I found that that's a tax write off too for parents. Yes, it is. (laughs) Yes, it is. So parents like don't underestimate your child's ability to be your social media person. Yeah. And, you know, tell them, I need help finding all the different hashtags. You know, those types of things are really cool for them. 
Um, and so once they can actually start to think creatively and realize that they're not contained, then I would let them do very structured things where they're going back to a digital medium, but it's just getting them outside. And it may even be, you just need to sit quietly with nothing. And it's almost like a, you know, what we would interpret as a, a meditation for ourselves. Um, but just to get their mind thinking again, because yeah. if you notice that they go from school, then whenever there's a, a quick break, they're on their phone. Mm-hmm. And now kids don't socialize verbally. They stand in circles. They all have their phones and they're texting. And then they kind of pop up and say, oh yeah, that's really cool. Well, that's not, that's not true social interaction. And I think this is actually a great opportunity to remind people of like, actually it's face-to-face. This is how, that is how you communicate. This idea of um, you know, the social distancing to a certain extent, I think is actually a blessing in disguise because now you have to reconnect with people in your own family and rediscover yeah. those relationships. And they're not going to be perfect, but at the bottom line, you've been given a gift to spend more time with your children, which is what everybody wants. Your children may not want it initially, but they will at the end. <laughs> you know, that's what I was going to ask you because I've brought it up to my kids that, you know, and I, I don't want to jinx myself here because like I said, we're only into our second week of this. But I was saying to them last night, I was like, you know, this isn't so bad. And you guys are having time to learn other things and you wouldn't normally be able to do. And when I brought up the idea of homeschooling, now they've been in public school and right. I brought up the idea, their first thought was panic. Like, well, I can't see my friends. Right. So how do you deal with the social aspect of homeschooling? Extracurriculars. Yeah. Extracurriculars. And so actually I, um, before I interview, I I was curious, I asked my children for some perspective and they pointed out that they do a lot of extracurriculars and they have anywhere from six to 20 kids in their different extracurriculars, depending on what they do. And so I think that uh, this is actually so interesting. The social distancing that we have where everyone is literally confined to their house. I think that is what most people think of for homeschooling. That that is all you do. You stay in your house and you don't interact with anybody. And that is the complete opposite because our kids are in choir. They're in soccer. They're in Hungarian scouts. Every wow. single night, I know. <laughs> I didn't even and know that existed. <laughs> it does. And they do the language too. Wow. Um, every single afternoon, they have some type of extracurricular activity and it's always interacting with people. And then there's a lot of homeschooling co-ops and in-person classes that people teach because they go, well, I'm right teaching history to my daughter. Why not open it up to other people? So those are easy to find. They're all around. And what ends up happening is it's just more focused time. And then depending on how it goes, you'll just, we'll tack on a play date. We know that there's a soccer game on Saturday at 11. And so we're going to just talk to some people and plan a a play date afterward. So it's really not any different. It's just, you can't talk to people in class, so to speak, five days a week. Yeah. And then recess. But as I said, you know, my children have seen, the social interaction drastically declined as people have phones yeah. and it's really sad. So I, they've, it's actually been a real struggle for them because they don't have phones. And as a 15 year old, not having a phone, um, it's, and, and she, it's, she's not pushing for it because she has seen what it has done to her friends, Yeah, but she's getting left out. And so it's a very interesting dichotomy that we're in. Um, where part of the way that people are connecting are through the text messages and Snapchat and Instagram. And if you don't have it, you get left out of that part of that loop. So it's a delicate balance for sure. Yeah. My, my older one has a phone now, but she's got like our ancient, ancient, like it's like six generations back, like galaxy phone and all her friends have the iPhones and they're, right. you know, they're always communicating and FaceTiming and whatever. Yeah. So she doesn't get to do that on a normal basis. And I don't let either one of them go on any kind of social media with what's going on now. I've kind of relaxed a little bit of that and Mm -hmm. we signed them up at the suggestion of another parent. And I looked into it and I'm like, all right, it doesn't seem that bad, but we did, uh, we're doing kids messenger through Facebook because I can control 
who they're allowed to connect with, and I can see what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I've actually now with the the social distancing, I'm making it like, okay, when all your work is done, Yes. And not until five o'clock, because I don't know what any of your other friends are doing. I don't know if their work is done, but not until after five o'clock are you allowed to contact your friends. And I've been having the younger one do video, con- con- like contacting them by video so that they can see and interact with their friends. Yeah. My older one is texting. And I was like, no, I want you to actually, like, if you're, I don't want you to just do the texting. I'm like, you need to still have that social interaction because we can't go out and we can't, you know, they're on sports and everything. We can't do sports. So, but get like, pick up the phone and talk to your friends or, Mm -hmm. or do some sort of video conferencing so that you can have those connections while while we're out. And the phone is a, is a completely lost art because when I was growing up, I, we used to get on the phone for an hour. You know hours. I mean? <laughs> yes. Hours, yes. I know, and I used to get in so much trouble. Oh, and I remember when I was in high school, you know, it'd be that typical high school kid. I said to my dad, oh, what a spoiled brat I was. But I said to him, well, it's either I talk to my friends or you pay for me to see psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so embarrassed that I pulled that one back then. But yeah. So, and, and that was actually a real... Community, a real bond that you formed with people texting isn't a substitute and so I think it's a it's a great opportunity to remind kids especially by the way if you have a landline then you're not having them hold the cell phone to their head so oh, yeah that's a great bonus now you can put that landline to use exactly exactly were there any other tips that you want to go over that I haven't asked you? Um, yeah. So I was going to recommend that, by the way, because the weather is getting better, get your kids into the dirt. So we are spending, we're so concerned about the virus. We're spending so much time cleansing and wiping everything down in hand sanitizers that I'm really concerned about what are the super bugs? that we're selecting for. Definitely. And, you know, we know the virus lives on surfaces for long periods of time. I've heard anywhere for like two days to nine days and it's in our clothing. So I, we need to be very mindful of that. But the anecdote is uh, really, you know, probiotics, your fermented foods, you can have your kids help you make fermented foods. It's a, it's a science project. Um, you can have them make um, broccoli sprouts, which are high in sulforaphane and are just fabulous for our bodies. Um, and, and those grow really quickly, but having them go outside and play in the dirt and just getting some of that good microbiome back onto their skin. Yes, you're going to have them wash their hands afterwards. Um, is I think it's really, really important because I'm concerned with all the Lysoling and especially the hand sanitizers with the triclosan that's in it. Those are endocrine disruptors. And so, you yeah. know, using it intermittently here and there, that's fine. But if you're home, please, please, like just soap and water and reminding them um, that when they do wash their hands, they really do need to spend some time. Like it's not a quick, okay, I'm done. That was enough. And there, um, Elisa Song has some great recipes on how to make your own hand sanitizer as well and getting them involved in that. Um, and it's, again, it's another science project, having them, um, you know, learn about viruses and bacteria and how it works with the, the microbiome as well. So I just, I, that's, that's a big concern I have. And then the other one is we know from a genetic perspective that some people are lower in vitamin C, they're lower in zinc, um, they're low, um, the FUT2 gene has to do with bifidobacteria. We know that really helps with diversity. Um, so going back and if you've done your genetics, um, that could be a fun thing that we follow up on. Just, um, you may have an increased need for your vitamin A, for zinc, for vitamin C than the average person. So just not forgetting our individual uniqueness and supporting our own immune systems um, to help us on this. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. And I do want to have you back too, to talk about your company at some point in time, because I'm getting an, you know, I was looking at it and I was like, I got to get an account with your company. You guys do genetic testing. We do. Yeah. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? 
So we do, it's end to end. So we go all the way from the kit through to the interpretation. And within the interpretation, we're going to give you recommendations on diet, lifestyle, supplements, further testing. So just because you have the gene doesn't mean it's being expressed. Um, and because we own everything from start to finish, we can control the privacy. So we, we protect everyone's nice. privacy very carefully. Um, if you say you want your data deleted, it's really easy. We do that and we don't do anything with your data. So we do every, our focus is chronic disease. What can you modify with this genetic information and what are the steps you can take? And so it's really an opportunity for you to identify from a genetic perspective, is this something that I need to focus on very acutely or is this a, 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 a later stage thing that I just, I just wanna monitor? Um, or why is it that I'm having trouble with these different lab values, like maybe a homocysteine? Um, why are my platelets consistently low or high? A lot of those things can be tied back to nutritional deficiencies, and they're usually genetic in origin. That's fat. Genes fascinate me. So if I didn't go into medical school, that was, I w- I'd applied to get my, my degree in genetics, but got into medical school first. <laughs> <laughs> and so. as a quick tip, so the way we perceive the world is often genetically, um, there's a genetic lens behind it. And so there's a lot of people who are filled with anxiety about the world. And then there's other people who are not. Yes. And COMT is how we break down our, a lot of our catecholamines, like our epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. So those of us who are slow may perceive the world with a, high, a heightened level of anxiety. You are more prone to worry versus the ones who are a faster COMT, like don't care because you're looking for that next dopamine hit. So being mindful that those can really come into play with your spouse, with your partner, the people you're interacting with. And it's not, it, it, it's not something that they even are necessarily aware that they're doing. It's just because that's who they are. And so if they're doom and gloom and you're like, hey, it's everything's going to be okay. What's wrong with you? It truly may be how their brain works. And so just knowing that you can honor it. Like, okay, this is, I understand it. And, but we're going to figure out a way to work together. The other part is if you are someone who um, goes through your dopamine faster, you are going to be looking for different opportunities to get a dopamine rush. You're not going to be able to go out and necessarily do your extreme mountain biking. Um, So be careful with addictive substances like alcohol or, you know, if anyone takes prescription drugs, this is an opportunity that some people may slip a little bit. So just being mindful Mm. of that, um, I think is really important. Those are great, great points. Thank you so much. Where can people find more information about you and your company? So it's toolboxgenomics.com. And if you enter toolboxgenomics.com forward slash Dr. Erica, you can order um, our nutrition optimization panel and a couple other ones, and you'll get 10% off. And in there will be the COMT and some of the different nutrition snips that I touched upon as well, if you're interested. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that you were able to talk to us. And uh, oh, me too. For the homeschooling tip. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Betsy. I hope you stay healthy and everybody stays well. Thank you. You too. Today's episode was brought to you by the Pelvic Floor Store, your source for personal health. You can find us at www.pelvicfloorstore.com. For more information on today's episode, and women's wellness, please go to drbetsygreenleaf.com. It is-